Treatment Room Secrets podcast, episode number 19. I'm here with Dr. Linda Bluestein. Um, thank you for joining me here in Cary, North Carolina. Of course. Very nice to have you here and good to be here ag again with Joe. Um, so you can fact check this if you want to, but I heard today from Joe that uh, Cary, North Carolina is the second largest town in America. What? Yeah, we're the town of Cary, not the city of Cary. So there's only one town that's got a larger population than us. What's the uh, threshold? <laughs> totally Defort made up. No threshold. Yeah. You call yourself what you want to call yourself. So we are in the second largest town in the United States of America. I'm here with Dr. Linda Bluestein. You came from uh, from Colorado, um, but you've kind of been all over the all over the place. You've been in uh, Wisconsin for many years, and but you born and raised in uh, California. Right. I was born and raised in Southern California. Southern California, L.A. Right. A suburb of Los Angeles in Torrance. Very cool. Um, and, you know, we're, we're here to discuss discuss something that I was ig ignorant to, um, completely ignorant to. I think I feel like I am still, and the world is, um, but completely ignorant to um, hypermobility, EDS um, and really everything on that spectrum, everything that yeah, you will dive into it, you'll explain to us um, what the terms mean, where do they fall, how do they affect people, all these different things. Um, we spend the time really putting together a lot of content um, that can really help people understand what this is, where we stand with it, where we're going with it, who's suffering from it, maybe why they're suffering and what can be done about it. Um, but it is pretty scary also seeing like we did yesterday, like real life examples of maybe a more physically visible extreme case. Um, maybe I don't know you. I'm sure I'm sure I've seen more extreme, but for me that was the most extreme I've seen. Um, so it's pretty scary, almost like mm -hmm. movie like uh, scenes that we had here. Mm -hmm. um, where did everything um, start with you? So, I never thought I would be a hypermobility specialist. It wasn't really part of my plans or anything. I started out wanting to be a professional ballet dancer. And when that didn't work out, went into medical school and trained to be an anesthesiologist. And I loved doing that. But eventually my medical problems caught up with me. And so I had to come up with a plan C, if you will, because being a professional ballet dancer was plan A. Then anesthesiology was plan B. And plan C was hypermobility specialist. I started working on improving my own symptoms. I was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS in 2012, and I started... So about a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Can I... Can I... I'm very interested to hear about uh, Plan B and Plan C, but I want to take you to uh, Plan A, um, becoming a, a dancer. Um, mm -hmm. Why? I loved it from the minute that I saw my first performance, took my first class. I was absolutely addicted. A young girl? Yes, as a young girl. My my dad asked me the other day, he said, why why do people dance? And I said, because they have to. Like, if you if this is your passion, because he said something like, do they do it for the money? Uh, and I just laughed. I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? There is there is no money for most people yeah. in dance. But it is it's if it's your passion, it's your passion. Like, you just enjoy moving your body in that way. And it was just the most joyous thing for me as a child growing up. And when did you realize, what age did you realize that it was your passion slash plan A in life? Probably I got really serious about it when I was maybe 10, 11, something like that. I think that's when I started taking a train after school and I would go, I lived in Northern California for five years and I would take a train and I would go from where I lived to Northern California, a little farther away, a couple hours away by car, and I would take class and then I would come back. And in hindsight, I can't believe my parents let me go on a train by myself, but this was in the 70s, you know, life was a little safer. So I would go take a train and I would take class and I took it a very, very serious professional school. So they were really training people to be, you know, the next generation of professional dancers. And then when we moved to Southern California and I went to a different school and everything was so kind of casual and it just felt like a very different culture, it was very shocking to me because I, 
I think also like there was a part of me that really liked the rigidity of ballet training. This is exactly what you're supposed to do. This is exactly what we want to see. And I think certain personality types that can be very appealing for us. So specifically you were training, the practicing training ballet? Classical ballet, yes. Classical ballet. Mm -hmm. um, and when you moved to back to Southern California and you um, found a new studio to, uh, to, uh, to, to join, uh -huh. the, the fact that it did not maybe meet your, your standards, your expectations, did you search for somewhere else or did you uh, just accept the way it was there? I did shop around a bit, and I remember being so disappointed that there wasn't a school close by or that was feasible to go to that didn't have the same style of, you know, if you're in this level, you wear this color leotard, and in the next level, you wear this color leotard, and this is exactly how you have to have your hair. This is exactly what you need to be wearing. I liked that. I liked that structure, and it was so much more casual and people would be wearing all kinds of extra leg warmers and things and um, but I found a school that was really really great and um, studied there for for many years and as a teenager that's when I started having more problems with my joints and realizing mm, this this plan of mine might not work out. Were you a talented dancer? I would say that I was pretty talented for the school that I was at but compared to other people, I I think for me also, I, I didn't want to be a dancer at a level that was not fairly high. And I, and I talent-wise, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So it was probably also somewhat convenient um, that I was able to give myself a reason for making a transition. And I continued to dance, but... I started to pursue studying the Pla pre-med class. Plan B. Yeah, plan B. Yep. But so I'm still, I'm going to stick with plan A. Um, so you, did you, at the time, um, now you're saying this all in retrospect, mm -hmm. obviously, but at the time, did you, did you believe that you could make it to those levels that you wanted to um, with practice, with dedication, with following the guidance of your instructors? Wow, that's a great question. I think I, I, Remember, because it's easy, there's a picture in a newspaper that I was interviewed when I was 16, and there's a quote from me. I'm 16 years old, and I said, ballet dancers have just as many injuries as football players. And obviously, I didn't know any statistics or anything at that point, but I just knew that ballet dancers had so many, I wasn't alone, ballet dancers had so many injuries. And I remember at that time, kind of processing the injuries and the pain and the fact that I that I really, really wanted to pursue that career, but I had also gone to some auditions and it's not like I was offered any great scholarships or anything like that to go to other schools. So it was it was hard psychologically. It was really, really hard. I went through a period where I was really having a hard time and it was because that was my dream. That's what I really wanted to do. The hypermobility, when you noticed maybe there was something, did you always notice there was something a bit different about your body? Well, the interesting thing was I wasn't the bendiest dancer in the room. I remember, I don't remember as much when I was in my teenage years, but when I went away to college and I went to UC Irvine, I chose that school because of their dance program. And there was a particular girl in class who was crazy, crazy flexible. And her name was Julia. And I can remember her like it was yesterday. You know, you're all wearing leotards and tights and you're making, you watch each other. So you're making observations about these things. And she had gorgeous extension. She could do all these incredible things with her body. But I remember observing that she didn't have as much strength as a lot of us. And what I observe now like she had more difficulty kind of organizing her body. That's something that a lot of dancers who have hy extreme hypermobility struggle with. So I had some hypermobility, but I wasn't as hypermobile as some of my other friends. Which, so that also makes me think that also that on itself can be dangerous because if you are hypermobile, but you're comparing to yourself, if you're comparing yourself to 
other people with you, training with you, who are way more hypermobile, you might think there's nothing unique about you, nothing different about you, or no reason to suspect that you should get this checked out, sorted out, or work on it. That's a fabulous observation and totally accurate. I think for dancers, because most people, at least once you get to a certain level, it's extremely common for people to have a certain degree of hypermobility because those of us that have hypermobility are able to exceed, we're able to succeed more, especially in something like classical ballet that requires quite extreme ranges of motion in order to achieve the aesthetic lines that we want to see. So I think that, right, we compare ourselves against other people. And so you don't notice that you're more bendy than other people other people because you're comparing yourself against your friends in your class, not against quote unquote regular people or people off the street. Yeah. Um, and another thing you've said there was, so we you know uh, someone can perform all these extreme range of motion um, movements and they can do all these, I think you said it was a beautiful extensions or uh, aesthetic lines. Yeah. All these, all these things that uh, maybe some dancers aspire to do and try and do. Uh, but they're lacking the strength. So what, they're just able to utilize the fact that they have this extreme range of motion to get into certain positions, but because of that, or they just don't um, develop the strength or don't rely on certain elements of strength to get into positions because they can almost uh, slip into it? Yes, I think some people, because they can so easily kind of kick their leg up in the air, but they don't have as much dedication towards the muscle development that is required. But it's also harder to build muscle strength if you're hypermobile. And it kind of makes sense if you think from a physiologic standpoint, in order to build muscle mass, you need to be able to put a certain amount of load on the muscle. And then the muscle says, oh, I need to get stronger because of that activity that the person did earlier. If your joint is hypermobile, if you have more range of motion than is quote unquote normal, and let's say, for example, we're talking about the bicep, because that's a muscle I feel like a lot of people can understand. If your elbow hyperextends, you have to bring it into being just regular straight before you go into any kind of flexion at the elbow to strengthen the bicep. So it's from a mechanical standpoint, can be harder to build muscle mass. And there's some interesting science being done, too. We think that even people who are completely otherwise asymptomatic from joint hypermobility, that they do have more difficulties building muscle mass than, quote-unquote, regular people. And proprioception is also an issue mm-hmm. that, um, that you know, this demographic suffers, um, suffers with. Um, why, why is that? Also, just for, for me, it's difficult to... Um, to kind of um, digest that, yes, you're hypermobile, so your joint will go um, to an extreme uh, range of motion, but what does that even mean that you don't know where it is? I'm in a privileged position where I think I always know where the <laughs> joints are. Um, so yeah, what, what is happening there? So we have stretch receptors in our tendons, and so if you are able to go past the normal range of motion, you're not getting the normal feedback to your brain. So for you, probably when your arm gets to be straight, first of all, from a mechanical standpoint, that's where you stop. But secondly, you probably feel that. Mm. So if someone tries to overextend my elbow, Mm -hmm. I'll get signals, stop, 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 stop. It'll be painful, right? It'll probably be painful for you. And for me, like this elbow isn't hypermobile anymore, my left elbow, because I had major surgery on it. But my right elbow still is to, to some extent. In order to be considered hypermobile, the elbows and the knees have to extend by more than 10 degrees. So if I extend my elbow by just a few degrees, that's okay. But if I go more than 10 degrees, now we're saying, okay, that's actually going into the hypermobile range. My brain doesn't know that I should stop when it's straight. It doesn't feel that. So I just keep going and I go past being straight. And what can happen is the tissues on the opposite side are not supposed to be stretched like that. They're not supposed to have that kind of physical forces on them. So especially if we do it repetitively, this can be problematic. A great example is because of my love of dance, I started doing Zumba a few years ago. 
and I loved it. It was so much fun. But then I would look at the mirror. I would look at myself in the mirror and I would realize I'm hyperextending my elbow. No wonder my elbows sometimes hurt after I take the class because I'm not aware that I'm going into hyperextension in my elbow. I'm not trying to do that. It's just happening automatically. What are some statistics about um, people that suffer from uh, hypermobility, EDS? Um, because I think the numbers are way higher than we than we would think. Um, us ignorant, um, and you mentioned that um, the numbers are growing potentially, um, or we're more aware of them. Um, and I suspect that there's probably listeners to this podcast that maybe don't even know that they might be hypermobile or someone in their family, social circle, um, patients, clients. Sure. So joint hypermobility, increased range of motion of the joint, is something that's that's very, very common. It's a little hard to quantify like in children because ideally we would have norms for every age and for fe females versus males. So it's a little harder when people are prepubertal to really assess is their joint range of motion normal or not because we don't really have good norms for each age and each sex. But once they reach past puberty, then we have a lot more data and we can do better assessments at that point in time. So some people with joint hypermobility will have the generalized type, generalized joint hypermobility. So that means they're hypermobile in a number of joints. One of the questions that I get quite frequently is, well, I'm hypermobile in some joints, but then I'm actually hypomobile or less than normal range of motion in other joints. And that definitely can happen. Just because a person has joint hypermobility in some joints doesn't mean that they're going to be hypermobile in every joint. But will it take it necessarily to that other extreme of hypo? It depends. If they have tight muscles that are trying to actually limit the range of motion because maybe there's some joint instability, then they can at least appear to be hypomobile in some other joints. So it gets complicated pretty fast. And EDS or the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are a group of hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So we know that that's passed on from generation to generation. And although from a statistical standpoint and a scientific standpoint, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see worsening of symptoms over time, a lot of us who are in this space and care for a lot of people with symptomatic joint hypermobility, we feel like people are running into more problems than their earlier generations. Can we try and, uh, for the listeners, like lay out the spectrum of what this um, syndrome looks like from literally one extreme to the other and where most people sit? Sure. So a lot of people... A lot of dancers, if they are 11, 12, 13 years old, and they haven't hit puberty yet, they might be completely asymptomatic. And they are basically in, in what I call the fun phase, where they have some joint hypermobility, and it's great for dance, but they haven't hit puberty yet, which was is when a lot of young uh, females... I ha sorry, I have, to, I have to ask, though, because it's a bit of a... Uh bit of like a mind fuck in my brain that it is, uh, excuse me, is um, is like, if you take something like dancing, mm -hmm. is the, the profession attracting people with hypermobility or are people in the profession, um, are they developing hypermobility because of the extreme circumstances of their training? I would say both. People who have hypermobility are going to be attracted to things like dance because they will excel at it more. Somebody who's not hypermobile may not stick with dance because they're not able to achieve the aesthetic lines and things. So they might give up sooner. They might quit sooner. But somebody who is really bendy will succeed in dance so long as they can develop the stability for around their joints to at least be able to do the various different maneuvers and things that you need to be able to do. But then what also happens is you actually may be accentuating your hypermobility because you're doing certain things again and again. And one example is doing the over splits. Some people will actually, instead of doing just the splits, if you're, say you're a rhythmic gymnast 
Yeah. You actually have to go past the splits in your leaps and jumps and things like that in order to get the right number of points for that maneuver. You actually have to have more than a 180 degree split, believe it or not. Which is wild. It is wild. It is wild. So what people will do is they'll put their front foot on a chair and their back foot on a chair, or they'll put the front foot on a on a block in order to go into the over splits. Okay. This, as you can imagine, puts a lot of strain on the hips. It puts a lot of strain on the knees. And I have patients that have told me that they strain they injured themselves incredibly because they were at a school where the teachers were not only putting their feet on chairs, but they were pushing their torso down between the chairs. So I think something like dance, rhythmic gymnastics, ice skating, synchronized swimming, I mean, there's gymnastics. Um, There's so many different types of activities that attract people with joint hypermobility, but then because of what's required in that activity, the hypermobility is often accentuated and or taken advantage of. Like we heard from our patient that we were working with, our sample patient. I mean, she was telling us about all that. So it's really challenging to use it in the proper way. And there are some dance teachers who are who are quite knowledgeable and they know how to work with the dancer and their hypermobility in the in a proper way, in a safer way. But there's others who are doing things that are really quite harmful actually to dancers' bodies. And so to me, that's another really huge thing is dancers and athletes and everybody who has hypermobility making good choices of where you will be working with various trainers and Pilates instructors and massage therapists and physical therapists, working with people who are getting some knowledge about these conditions and understanding why they're so important. To me, that's a really huge thing is having those resources to be able to direct people to. So I try to keep track of schools in my area, you know, dance studios in my area and knowing what are the different habits and patterns that are happening at these different schools. Because I've heard physical therapists say, I get a ton of kids from this one school all with the same hip injury. And I think it's tied to what they're doing at that school. I'm currently working on my uh, split. And I have, <laughs> and I'm not at the level where I can put my feet up on two chairs and uh, have someone push me. Um, so, but, but, so, but you were saying something to me earlier where to perform the split perfectly, um, you actually have to, you said dislocate your hips. You, you basically are subluxing your subluxing, hips. Yeah. They're a partial dislocation when you are doing the splits. And you might be dislocating your hips. Probably not. You're probably subluxing. They're probably not completely coming out of socket. The hip is a much more stable joint than the shoulder because in most people, the the, the um, hip socket is much deeper than the shoulder, which is a much more shallow. A lot of people, I used to compare these all the time. I used to be like, oh, they're both ball and socket joints. They're really not. The shoulder is much more like a plate and a ball, and the hip is much more like a ball and socket joint. But people who have hip dysplasia have a very, very shallow joint, so they can do all kinds of incredible things with their hips, but their hip is probably constantly sliding in and out. It's probably dislocating constantly because they don't really have that nice cup that's surrounding the head of their femur. So I'm not sure if I were you, if I would be really trying to get your splits or thinking about why am I trying to do this? I was talking with a young person the other day and I happened to be then having dinner with a physical therapist and with this person. And I said, why don't you ask her what she thinks about you trying to get your splits as a young adult? And the physical therapist was like, unless you need to have that for dance or something else that you're, that you're pursuing as a as a career, mm-hmm. it's probably not in your best interest to do that. So just feeding feeding uh, my ego is not a good enough reason. <laughs> um, no, but can it be a cheat? Because I don't. Um, I'm not at ex- an extreme uh, level where I don't think my hips are coming out of place. Um, but can it be performed just relying on groin flexibility, um, using some leg strength to get into that position without damaging your hips? 
Well, what this physical therapist said to me, and she is the physical therapist for one of the big ballet companies, and this was the first time I had heard somebody say this, but she, what she had said is, in order to get one leg mm -hmm. flat in the front and the other leg flat in the back, if you think about it, the head of your femur is not going to be in proper alignment anymore in the hip socket. Okay. I would like to see imaging actually like that. Like what, what does that look like on somebody with normal hips? Um, yeah. So it's, so it's more than normal if, um, you kind of hit a, or I hit a wall where I just cannot get any closer to the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be a very normal thing. Yeah. Doing the splits, especially, I mean, you're still young, but doing the splits is something that is, I don't want to say it's not normal, but it's something that a lot of people can't do, and trying to achieve that may or may not be a wise thing in the long run. It depends. It depends on what what your goals are. No, but you see that um, it's an important uh, thing to mention because you know I obviously I was a bit, um, it's not for my career. It's not for anything besides just trying to be more flexible. Mm -hmm. But I could be causing more damage for the long run without even me knowing. So maybe in a few months I'll be able to do it. But in a few years, the um, damage will start kicking in, kicking in. So I think that's also important to note. But I interrupted you. You were beautifully starting to lay out the spectrum. Um, and I jumped into the opportunity of asking about dancers. Um, so no problem. And I use them as an example just because yeah. it's so highly prevalent in that population and because it's so visible in that population. And we have these um, competitions and social media and hypermobility is so often the goal and praised and it's the person with the most hypermobility is often put right in the front and center and they are doing various different tricks and things that it's it's fine if they can do it and if they can do it safely and it doesn't harm their body but the difficult thing is we don't really know what's going to happen with that particular person 10 years down the road and 20 years down the road and and more and now people are living so much longer. So we really want our our bodies to function as well as possible for as long as possible because peaking as a dancer at age 12 or 13, but then having difficulty walking when you're 60, you know, it's, it's hard because it's not like we have perfect data to say, if you do this, then you will have this problem. But that's my concern now is that there's so much more extremes, ranges of motion than, than there used to be. When I was dancing, there was no social media, there were no competitions, and so we didn't see a lot of this really extreme stuff that's happening now. And if you look at photos in books that talk about ballet, the leg was so much lower, and the leg has gotten higher and higher and higher and higher. And what concerns me is that we don't know the ramifications because this is such a recent, recent phenomenon. Could we try and uh, lay out that spectrum? Sure. So, so we have people who are asymptomatic. So they, and they may be enjoying their hypermobility. It may be beneficial for them. And again, if they're working with a physical therapist or a skilled athletic trainer or somebody who can really observe them and, you know, like for you, if you were working with a physical therapist and they were helping guide you through that process and saying, for your body, I think that's a safe thing to do. That's one thing, but I think... Keeping you in check, in place exactly. as you develop. Exactly. Yeah. And and really helping you to do things in in, a, in the safest possible way. Because we always we don't always know what types of ramifications we'll get. I use the example a lot of, you know, getting a sunburn. You're sitting at the beach and you don't really realize that you're getting a sunburn. And I realized years later, as I've had multiple skin cancers cut off my face, it's not just the sunburn, but it's the skin cancer. You know, and I know that I'm, it might sound like I want to wrap everyone in a bubble, and I don't want to do that. But I do want to help people at least make a risk-benefit analysis about the skin cancer while they're doing these other activities as, as much as possible. So we have the person on the healthy end of the spectrum. They're asymptomatic. They're not having pain. They're, they're hypermobile. They have this increased range of motion, and it might be really beneficial for whatever sport they're doing, whatever musical instrument that they're playing, 
And and so that's that's one end of the spectrum, completely asymptomatic. We also have people who maybe they're they're mildly symptomatic. So they might be experiencing some issues with their joints, but they're still able to function well and they're still able to have a have a job or attend school and, and that kind of thing. Were you in that category? Yes. Oh. Yes, I was in that category. Um, I had a lot of frustrations with, like, at one point with my migraines, I had pain in my head that lasted for months, and I was finally hospitalized, and they gave me a very powerful medication called DHE, which they give it as an infusion, and you just throw up for a couple of days <laughs> to try to break the cycle. Um, but other than the fact that I had a various different symptoms, which were very frustrating, I was at least able to function. I was able to finish school, and, um, and so that was very fortunate. On the other end of the spectrum are people who can be very, very severely impacted by their disease. So if a person has one of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes, which is, a, again, a hereditary disorder of connective tissue, connective tissue is present all throughout your body. So you can have symptoms in literally just about every symptom of the body. Every, you can have symptoms in literally every system of the body, excuse yeah. me. So I had this one patient that that comes to mind. She was very, very sick. And when I saw her, she was the sickest patient I had ever seen at that time. And I remember her father saying to me, do you really think she can get better? And I said, yes. And afterwards I thought, should I have said that? Yeah. <laughs> because I've never seen anyone as sick as her and I really hope that she can get better. But at the time I saw her, she was only eating two or three foods she laid down for the entire visit. She laid down in the car for her parents to drive for several hours to come see me. So, so bad she couldn't even sit up straight. Correct. Her heart was racing so fast. She had been evaluated for sleep apnea and was found to have both obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. So the kind of sleep apnea where your, where your throat basically collapses and cuts off your airway and the kind of sleep apnea that it comes from your brain. And she was very thin. So this was very concerning. So this is not somebody that could lose weight and their obstructive sleep apnea would go away. So she had major digestive problems, major dysautonomia problems or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. She had the EDS. She also had mast cell activation syndrome, which is where the mast cells part of the immune system are hypersensitive and release their mediators very easily. And so I started working with her and fortunately we were able to get her feeling a lot better but she came to me very, very sick, and it was recommended that she have a detailed evaluation in person in New York for possibly having fusion of her cervical spine. But fortunately, we were able to get her feeling much better before she traveled out there, so she didn't have the surgery. So, yes, you you said yes to the dad, then you're unsure, um, but someone on the extreme side of the spectrum... Can they get better? And I know better is a subjective term. Mm -hmm. um, depends what we're aiming for. Right. Um, but can they get to a place where they can live life? Obviously, not being able to sit up straight is not living life. Correct. And, and this young lady was in her early 20s. And she is a pretty extreme example, probably. And I use her example a lot because it is so remarkable. So if any of my patients are listening to this, they might think, oh my gosh, she uses that same example over and over again. There's lots of other examples that I have of people who I have seen or know about who have been quite ill and have gotten significantly better. But every situation is so incredibly unique. So there is hope for people yes. on that side of the spectrum. And that's where people like yourself come into the picture. Um, and, you know, we even saw kind of an example of this yesterday mm -hmm. on just being able to speak to someone who understands what you're going through, can validate what you're going through, can give you some guidance. Um, just that is probably a huge first step for people on the more extreme side of the spectrum to to start that journey of getting better, whatever better means. Um, so do we lack that? Do we lack individuals like yourself, um, you know, to to really raise awareness, guide, help, treat these individuals, or even on prevention from, because 
I mean, I think you said that someone on the lower end of a spectrum uh, who is even maybe using it as a benefit to their life mm -hmm. being hypermobile. There's no promise that they won't keep climbing up that ladder to the other side of the spectrum. Exactly. That's my concern. If somebody's asymptomatic, we don't know. Are they going to develop symptoms in the future? And my feeling is we should be trying to optimize everyone's health, no matter where they are on the spectrum. And I feel like everyone I have seen so far, there's always been things that we could try at least. And I don't know for sure what's going to work because I don't have a crystal ball and we don't have any FDA approved treatments for these conditions. But fortunately, there are a lot of things that we can try. And even just listening to the person is helpful, as we saw yesterday. Listening to them and telling them, I believe you. But why do we have this gap? Why are there no FDA-approved medications? Why do doctors not know enough about this? Like, how, how are we in this situation? <laughs> I believe that in the U.S., and it's probably true in other countries, because I hear from people all over the world, our medical care is really designed to help people with acute problems. We do much better with acute things than we do with chronic complex conditions. And most chronic conditions are going to be more complicated and take more time. And in, so much of our healthcare is dictated by insurance companies. And insurance companies don't really value spending time with a patient. So most people have observed that visits have gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. And my dermatologist will see, I've heard 80 patients in a day. That's hard to believe. But like, I, I have colleagues that definitely will see 40 patients in a day, day, a day. And the most that I have ever seen, I've seen for follow-up visits, I'll see like seven in a day. But for a new patient, the most that I will see is usually three a day. And before COVID, I would usually only see two a day because it takes so much time to really get a full comprehensive history from people and to really get enough details to figure out what are some really good starting points in their treatment plan. Because at the end of the day, I want to address the root cause and not just put a Band-Aid on something. It's 40 a day. Um, you know, even if you said... Even 15, 20 a day, it sounds crazy to me. Um, and these chronic diseases, syndromes, um, do take time, do take investigation. And there's no one in the system that's incentivized um, to really dig deep and find a solution for this. So is that your mission? Pretty much. <laughs> um, you know, I guess what I didn't point out is if you've seen 40 patients in a day, you have billed for 40 patients that day. So those 40 patients are all contributing to your overhead. And what people don't realize is that if their insurance company is paying the bill, oftentimes we don't pay attention. And I'm guilty of this too. If I'm not paying the bill because I've already met my deductible or because I used to have like a really great health plan, I didn't pay as much attention as when I had to pay it myself. So I really think the third-party payer system is hugely problematic in this area. They are much more willing to pay for procedures and surgeries than they are willing to pay for someone to do the detective work to get to the bottom of a person's situation and improve their functional capacity. But also from a doctor's perspective, I'm trying to think um, what, even if the financial incentives put it that way were the same, surgery or putting your investigator's cap on, you're trained to do surgery. You're trained for a skill. You're trained to, you know, to accomplish a certain mission. Um, whereas the other one takes your time, takes your mental effort, creativity, um, the unknown, really. And you might dedicate time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears to it, and have no solution. Yeah. Um, so. Even without the financial reward that comes with surgery, I can also see why doctors would lean the other way. Um, but you, so so you know what what makes what makes you different? Um, because uh, is it because it's a personal thing? You think? I, I think so. I think I'm so passionate about it because of the fact that I have 
been in such worse physical shape than I am now. And although I'm not in perfect shape now by any means, but I, I just feel like most people deserve to have somebody really listen to them and to help them. And you really hit the nail on the head. I think surgeons often get frustrated because they have, they, they identify a problem and they want to do the surgery to fix it. And it, I'm not saying that it's straightforward for them. It's not. They have to know a ton of things. They have to know a ton of medical things. And of course, yeah, and I'm not belittling the, uh, right. the skill at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it's an incredible, it's an incredible skill set. And of course, you have to know how to deal with all kinds of complications that come up and things like that. So that's really important. And of course, we need surgeons, but we do need people to do this detective work too. And you're absolutely right. It can be less rewarding. And nobody really teaches us this. Like I didn't learn much of this in medical school. In medical school, I learned a lot of things. And I'm using a lot of what I learned in my anesthesia residency and from caring for patients for 25 plus years as an anesthesiologist. But no medical school really trains this kind of care. And if you think about it, it's especially tricky because people who have hypermobility that might have one of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes or hypermobility spectrum disorders, as we talked about before, they can have symptoms in any system of their body. And we generally are taught in medical school that each system is separate. And we might be taught some about the overlap, but you're going to have a class in immunology that's going to be separate from a class on, you know, pathology or so. These different things are going, going to be different classes and we're not really taught, I don't think, enough about the integration of different things in the body. And, you know, when you say like integrate the integration of different systems in the body, um, and again, I'm not, you know, saying that one is better than the other or anything like that. But when I, my first exposure to traditional Chinese medicine, the first thing they tell you is that everything is connected. <laughs> So everything, every system affects the other system. And, you know, if um, if you're suffering from one thing, it could mean that it's connected to everything else in your body, which, again, could um, could lead to the other side of the spectrum where you may be overthinking or overconnecting different things. But it's just, um, it's a school of thought um, that just feels um, intuitive and to expand on your point um, and I think also something we that blew my mind yesterday with the patient is this joint you know with joints we think of wrists we think of knees elbows but we don't think of like ribs we don't think of things that we you know that we don't see so where does that come in all these different symptoms that we just can't see uh, because you said it's anything to do with connective tissue right 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 and can connective tissue be found anywhere in the body? Connective tissue is all over your body. We talked a little bit yesterday about like gastrointestinal symptoms, for example, and things like constipation or problems evacuating stool can be because the connective tissue is so lax that the wall of the colon expands and people can have problems with food propelling through the gastrointestinal tract because of connective tissue laxity. So we can have any part of the body affected. I was having a problem with my throat. I've gotten a lot of sore throat without infection. And I went through a period of time where this was happening quite frequently. Fortunately, it was pre-COVID or else I probably would have been doing lots of COVID tests. And I went to see the ENT doctor and she basically told me everything's fine. Ehlers-Danlos doesn't affect the tissues in the airway. And as an anesthesiologist, I'm thinking, well, why would those tissues be different? Why would that be unaffected when any other tissue in the body could be affected? So since then, now there's a group that's doing research into otolaryngolic type problems that people run into. Lots of people can have difficulty swallowing and sore throat and difficulty with their voice and all, vocal strain and all kinds of other things that may or may not be connected to having a connective tissue disorder. But I'm, I'm totally with you. I believe that everything is connected. I believe that we treat the mind and the body as being much more separate than they actually are. Everything is connected. What we think affects how we feel and vice versa. So I think we need to be doing much more of this integration. So you give up being a dancer 
uh, sorry for using the word give up. Oh, you had, yeah. you know, you you, yeah. you moved on um, to plan B um, in life. And how did you, um, how did you end up choosing what you chose and your path? Well, what I really wanted to do was sports medicine. But at that point in time, when I was finishing medical school and you have to pick what residency you want to do, I thought sports medicine really meant orthopedics. And somehow, even though I was young, I knew that I didn't have the strength to do traditional orthopedic medicine. I don't think I really knew at that time that there were some sports medicine doctors that were medical in nature and that they approached things from a medical standpoint rather than a surgical standpoint. So even though I didn't have a diagnosis yet, I wasn't even close to a diagnosis. In fact, I would get a diagnosis decades later. I somehow knew that that would be challenging on my body. So I had always been fascinated with pharmacology and physiology, and I had a family member growing up that had had some very serious health problems, and I had actually been in the ICU at a very, very young age to visit this family member, and anesthesia seemed like a great specialty to pursue. You got to use your hands. You got to do things in a more rapid manner. And it's funny because I used to say all the time that I didn't have the patience really to see a patient in a clinic setting, prescribe a treatment plan, and then see them back a few months later. And that was part of why I chose anesthesiology because you inject a medication into the IV and it takes like an immediate effect. Everything is much more condensed. But um, obviously that's what I'm doing now prescribing a treatment plan and then waiting and waiting and seeing, does it make them better? Does it make them worse? What do we need to change? It's a constant process of tweaking things, trial and error, working with the patient to improve their quality of life. So how was your, you know, the, your career be as a anesthesiologist, which I told you I've been practicing. So. <laughs> you nailed it. I really enjoyed it and it was and it was great for quite a while. I started to run into more problems with with my health and so um, it became closer to the end of my career. It became more frustrating, but I really did enjoy the more fast-paced nature of it. Um, you know, it's it's also a spectrum where you can have somebody we talked about this yesterday, like you can have somebody very very healthy for a very low risk surgery and you know, it's that's nowhere near as mentally taxing as if you have a very risky surgery or somebody who is very, very ill. So you kind of do a whole spectrum of care from things that are pretty straightforward to people that, you know, come in and they've been in a major car accident and their body is just like completely in shambles and the surgeons are going to try to put them back together and you're trying to make sure they don't die. So it was very, very stressful. I did, I did really enjoy it. The call was hard, you know, being on call a lot and having to come in in the middle of the night. But um, but it was re rewarding. Do you miss it? In some respects, I definitely do. Um, because you go through a lot of training in order to learn how to do the things that you do as an anesthesiologist, and I don't get to use those skills anymore. There was a patient, an, a patient, I was hiking shortly after I moved to Colorado, and a gentleman had collapsed on the trail. And they originally told us, nobody can go past here because we're trying to get EMS up there or whatever. And my husband said, three of the four of us in this group are physicians, so do you want us to go up and see if we can help? And we did. And somebody was managing the airway. And I think I said, do you want me to help? And they kind of looked at me and they said, well, I'm an ophthalmologist. Kind of, what are you? Like, you know, let's compare who might have better, a better skill set. I said, I'm an anesthesiologist. And they're like, all yours. Because that's, as an anesthesiologist, like airway management is one of the absolute most important things that we do. So I sat on a rock and got on the floor and managed this guy's airway. And it may sound really weird, but there was something really rewarding in that because it was like, I could use one of these skills that I worked so long to attain, and I miss, I miss being in that very, very elite club, you know, that actually gets to go behind the doors, the, the big doors of, you know, 
trying to save someone's life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, I don't think it sounds weird at all. Um, so that guy, that guy is lucky. Is he, was he okay in the end? Unfortunately not. Um, he had, though, been down on the ground for at least 15 minutes before anybody got to him. He was hiking with his girlfriend and collapsed. It was a hot day over Labor Day weekend. And so, and he, and he had no pulse. When we got to him, he had no pulse. So a bystander was doing CPR and they were trying to get help up there. But we were in, we were far enough on the trail that we were pretty isolated. So it was very difficult to get help to him. But for you, the reward was trying to step up. Yes. Trying exactly. to do your thing that you trained uh, so long to right. do. Right. Um, and also, what, over almost a decade since you stopped uh, practicing? My, I literally know my exact last day because it was, it was Christmas Eve 2015. And I remember because I was working with one foot in a boot and both wrists in wrist braces because I was having so much pain in my wrist and I had arthritis in my thumb. I should have known like my days were numbered because it was getting harder and harder to use my hands and drop drugs all day and do all the things that you need to do. Um, but I was, I was getting to my car and I was scraping the ice off my car and I remember exactly where I was, what hotel I was at. I was doing locum tenens at the time, which is like substitute teaching for doctors. And I was scraping the ice off my car and I fell. So here I was with three extremities and braces. I fell and that wrist was already in bad shape, but that, that didn't make it any better. So I ended up having surgery very early on in 2016 and then had complications and was never able to go back to work. So because of that fall, that, that was your last day at work? Or was, so it wasn't a planned last day at work? It wasn't a planned last day of work. And I should explain that I fell, got up, got in my car, drove to work, and still took call that night because that's what you do. And still put in a couple of epidurals. And, you know, I remember there was a case, not that last day, but, you know, if, so if somebody is in the CT scanner and they have an allergic reaction to the contrast dye and they call you for help, you hop up on the table and you do whatever it is that you need to do to save the person's life. So you are putting your own body often in compromising positions and doing things to your body that are maybe not optimal um, in order to do your job. So when does um, the hypermobility MD, um, you know, wake up when it, <laughs> or uh, when is it born? So which is I, uh, Plan C, right? Plan C. So in 2017, no, wait, let me back up. In 2016, so January of 2016, I had my surgery and I was not able to go back in 12 weeks, as was expected after the bone grafting surgery in my wrist. And I went to an anesthesia conference late in 2016 because I still wanted to learn and I and I wasn't completely ready to to give up. And I met someone who worked for a pain management journal, and she asked me if I would write an article. And she said, pick a topic and throw it at us, and we'll see what we think. So I was in an aqua Zumba class, and all of a sudden I went, oh, the light bulb went off. I said, I should write about pain management in hypermobility, because at that point I knew that I had EDS. Because you were diagnosed in 2012, you said. Exactly. Let's go. So let's go to the diagnosis. Um, sure. Before we make the transition into sure. um, what you're doing now. Um, so the di so how did that come about? Because of health complications, you started investigating deeper. Right. So I had what's called a Tarlov cyst, and this is something that oftentimes they'll say, "Oh, it's an incidental finding," but I had this Tarlov cyst, and I had severe sciatica, and it's a, it's a cyst that's basically compressing nerves on the spinal cord, and I was reading about Tarlov cyst, just trying to understand, is this really the problem? I didn't want to have surgery for this if it wasn't really actually causing the problem. So I was reading about Tarlov cyst, and I came up across something that said, Tarlov cyst is more common in people with connective tissue disorders. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I started reading more about connective tissue disorders. And as I was reading about that, I was like, oh my gosh, I think this could explain literally my entire life. As the age of? Um, well, let's see. I would have been in my 40s at that time. Yeah. 
And the first rheumatologist that I saw walked in the room and said, why are you here? You want to have a rheumatologic con condition? And I was like, no, of course I don't. I want an explanation for why I'm having all these problems. I kept telling my PCP, something is wrong. I get injured so easily. Things don't heal right. And the rheumatologist, the first rheumatologist I saw, basically said, you're fine. You have no problem. Go away. Go do aqua aerobics. and Which is what we said a lot of people end up hearing. Exactly. Super, super common. Extremely common. I saw another rheumatologist maybe six months or so later who said, man, your joints are very hypermobile. And he did a detailed physical exam and said, you have Ehlers-Danlos. Here's some information about it. But basically, there's no treatment and no cure. So you're, so you're diagnosed without any real guidance or real any hope. Right. Um, but you have the diagnosis at least. So that kind of gives you the ground to now we can jump four or five years forward. Sure. Um, into investigating, into um, the, pain oh, the pain management. Right. Pain right. management journal. Right. So I came up with, oh, I should write about hypermobility and pain management for people with hypermobility. So then I started writing the article, and it was really ironic timing because the article was, we were going back and forth on it, so it was not something that, you know, you have to worry, is, gonna, is it going to be accepted or not, because this is a continuing medical education journal. And because we were working together on it, it was basically accepted and was going to be published. And it was finalized, complete, completely ready to go when they announced the revised criteria for EDS in March of 2017. And I immediately emailed the editor and I said, wait, do not publish this because it's already out of date. And I said, I want to revise some of the sections. And ironically, we were going on vacation around this time and I had actually developed an ulcer on my cornea. And it was horribly painful to look at a screen. But I was so determined that I wanted the article to be as up-to-date as possible at the time that it was published. But in my head, I remember thinking, reframe the situation. Instead of being disappointed that you have to rewrite this, this is probably wonderful timing because now I can publish something that is, because it was mostly because it was done, <laughs> but it, it will be something that could be maybe a very good branching off point for people who are looking for options for care, and it's something that will be published very soon after the criteria were revised. So I was able to reframe it that way, publish the article, and at that time I was still off work, trying to figure out what was my plan C going to be, because I knew that I needed to do something. And people started emailing me after the article was published in July of 2017, and they would ask, where can I come see you? And I had to tell them, I don't have a place that you can come see me. I don't have a clinic or anything. One of my colleagues, Dr. Pradeep Chopra, talked me into opening a clinic. He's an anesthesiologist. He said, you're an anesthesiologist. You understand the cardiopulmonary system. You understand the gastrointestinal system, neurologic. Like You, you need to know so many things in such a diverse way that it would be really a shame if you don't try to use what you know to help this population. And I remember talking with him shortly before I opened my clinic. I was like, it's like you're having a baby. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. He's like, you're ready. You need to just do it. And so in November of 2017, I opened my clinic. And at that time, it was called Wisconsin Integrative Pain Specialists. But I later changed the name to Hypermobility MD because I knew that I would be moving to Colorado and I wanted I wanted a name that was not state specific. And I had been using the hashtag Hypermobility MD on a lot of my social media posts. And what is the most um is there a reward that you um that you feel since um, you know, having this baby? Um, of hypermobility MD, of maybe seeing individuals who are, you know, have some overlap with you on that, you know, big spectrum that we uh, described earlier. Um, 
where's the fulfillment there for you? It's interesting because I remember when I was probably at one of my lowest points, my PM and R doctor had sent me to a psychologist. And the psychologist said to me, can you see anything good that has come out of this situation? No, nothing, nothing whatsoever. But now, all these years later, I feel like it has really helped me personally so much to be able to care for people who are either similarly situated or are much worse off than I am or people who are doing better than I was. So it's really been so rewarding to me to see people validated and hearing from them, even if it's on social media and I'm not working with them one-on-one. -on -one. I get messages all the time. I feel seen. I feel heard. And that really is what keeps me going because the work is very, very hard. It's, it's exhausting. At the end of a day when I've seen two or three new people, I'm, I'm emotionally spent because I'm hearing their story and it's often so tragic, all the things that they've gone through. Are you hearing your story come out of their mouth sometimes? Usually worse. Usually worse. And there's so much that I hear that I just think, oh, there's so much that we need to change. There's so much that we need to do so that people don't get to this point, so that they get help much sooner. I'd like just to mention, um, because, you know, we mentioned this patient model that we um, that we got to meet yesterday. Um, and obviously you spent the majority of this time speaking with her and her family, not me, um, but observing from, from, you know, from, from a distance from the outside. Um, it was therapeutic for the girl. It was therapeutic for the family, um, really just to speak with you um, and just to um, have you look at the girl without, you know, thinking she's crazy or making up stuff um, and have some words of encouragement, have some words of hope, of trying to paint that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, just that it was honestly like fulfilling for me to see, witness. Um, so it's it pretty magnificent. So, um, you know, I think you're doing an incredible, you know, job just being out there um, and almost, uh, you know, maybe it's, I, mean, I know it's harsh to say, but you going through all those decades without any guidance, without any, without a diagnosis, without help, without anything, um, kind of maybe built up all this energy that's now infused into you that can really, uh, really help. And we're lucky that, you know, you have social media, you have a podcast, you have uh, this online course, we have all this, you know, all these resources to really spread the word as much as we can. Um, so please tell people uh, where they can find you um, and also mention the name of your podcast as well. Sure. So my podcast is called Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. And I started that podcast because I wanted to make this information as accessible as possible. And I did also recently publish a two-part series in the same journal that I published in 2017 called Hope for Hypermobility. And it basically talks about an integrative approach to treating these conditions and how that can really help to alleviate pain and other symptoms. And all, to wrap it up, I want to ask you, where, where do you see this going? Where do you see um, our medical system, um, you know, developing this um, this syndrome or the, the protocols around this syndrome? Where do you see this uh, going? Is there hope? Um, and, as, you know, especially it seems like we need to structure something. We need to kind of start thinking about this more seriously um, because if the numbers are growing or if we're more exposed to it or if modern day uh, lifestyles, technologies are maybe... Um, helping this uh, syndrome spread um then yeah well what, what does the future look like in your eyes or in your belief so COVID actually is a fascinating player in all of this because we always get back to COVID somehow <laughs> right right you didn't see that one coming so COVID actually has in a fascinating way changed the landscape of healthcare, and hopefully the 
increased accessibility to specialists is something that will be continued into the future because before COVID, telemedicine was hardly at all a thing, right? But now we have much more ability to access telemedicine. And there are specialists that are spread throughout the country, throughout the world, but there's just not enough of us. There's not enough access to us either because a lot of us don't take insurance because of the fact that these appointments are so incredibly long. And so I think that with time, we will have more and more people trained to recognize these conditions. And I believe that that will benefit everyone. And there's also programs like what the Ehlers-Danlos Society puts on, the ECHO program, which the University of New Mexico, they founded this program called the ECHO program, which is phenomenal. I took the ECHO pain program when I was first starting to treat pain patients. And what they do is they, they offer this additional training that you just join online. This is pre-COVID that they had incredible programs, by the way, through COVID, incred incredible educational programs for physicians and, and other um, healthcare professionals, and offering this education that is so incredibly important and valuable and bringing in different experts and things like that. So there's actually an ECHO program for the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes that helps clinicians become more knowledgeable about these conditions. So I think that's going to also be really helpful in order to spread the word and for people to be more aware and be looking for these things and helping to alleviate people's symptoms to the degree that we can. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Linda Bluestein, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been so fun hanging out with you. I just love what you guys are doing and you ask such great questions. I love it. And can't wait till the next time. Me too. If you liked this video and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification button.